All right. Good morning. Nice to see so many people of you here on a Monday morning talking to boring stuff like this. I love it that you came over here. But we're going to talk about some common mistakes with functional Java. And I have to say first that we, are, we programmers are a bit like little children, right? I mean, if I give my little cousin a new toy, he wants to do everything with it. He wants to take it to the bathroom, he wants to shower with it, wants to take it to school, wants to sleep with it, wants to do simply everything with it. And that's a bit of the same thing, I guess, with us as developers, because if we have a new toy, and we actually read the documentation or not, we tend to use it everywhere. I mean, and it does mean that some things you use are not particularly in the way they are designed. I mean, you see this guy over here in, on a motorcycle. Who of you guys on, or gals rides a motorcycle or ever? A few of you. You can ride a motorcycle like this, and it brings you from A to B, but I'm still wondering how this guy shifts gears. I mean, for those of you who do not ride a motorcycle, you shift gear with your foot. And it's pretty impossible, I think. So you, people tend to use or misuse new code constructions just to make use of them because they're fun, right? And it's, it's a bit like that saying with, um, when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And that's what we tend to see in different, uh, I tend to see in different projects all over the place I work with. And probably you can say, well, hey, it works, right? And um, if it's stupid, but it works, it is still stupid. I mean, do you love your coworkers or don't you love your coworkers? That's the big question. Of course, we've got these guys like product owners and the functional people. And perhaps you can say to them, trust me, I'm an engineer. But normally, that wouldn't work out with the people you work with because I tend to work with smart people. Hi, I'm Brian. I'm a software engineer for a small company in the Netherlands called Blue for IT. I'm involved with uh, two jugs, the Utrecht jug for the city of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and of course the NL jug, so a big shout out to these guys. And um, first and most of all, I'm an engineer. So all these things I talk about today are things I've seen in different projects. And some of these things are pretty obvious, and some of these things perhaps not. Just take a look at the first one. The simple first one is doing too much in a single lambda. Well, first. Let's, let's, get, let's get to the basics. What is a lambda? Wow, that's a lot of text. A lambda expression, something with arguments being passed to a higher order function, blah, blah, blah. All right. Simply, let's say that a lambda, fu a, a lambda function is a higher order function. So a higher order function, you can give a function as a parameter to a function. Or the other way around, you can create a function that creates the function. Well, most of the time, if, as, when we use lambdas in Java, you can somehow, whatever, say it's like an anonymous inner function. Not exactly, but just for the sake of reasoning. It satisfies the functional interface, and you can simply write them in two different ways. You've got on the lower line, you see the two examples. You can write them as an input, a function arrow, and an output. Or you can do the input, a function arrow, and a complete function body. So let's go to the first example. I have a very naive higher order function over here in red. You see that my handle beers function takes a beer. And normally I do this talk more at night, so people tend to use beers. But yeah, I probably should change this one in coffee. But this higher order function takes a beer and takes a function. And it simply applies that function on that beer and gives me a side effect by printing something. But it's a higher order function, right? When we use this function here, we can provide it a lambda. And this one is a single line lambda. And because it's a single line lambda, it's quite obvious and it's quite readable. And I can do it in line. That's the way a lambda is supposed to be written, in my opinion. But what do you see is that people tend to write, want to do more in a single lambda. And they tend to write block lambdas. And then you end up with things like this. Let's do something if else statements, nested, try, catch, whatever. And if we go back to the basics of functional programming, 
it is intended to be expressive and make your code more readable. Who thinks this lambda is more readable than a single line lambda? Everyone, awesome. You're not paying attention. So what can you do? If we have a block lambda like this, I want to do more in a, in a single lambda than just a single line. Well, we have things like methods for years. So if we simply transform this lambda into a method and call it with the awesome method reference we have, my higher order function or my function call is still readable. I abstract the things in a certain way. And I, yeah, I keep it simple. Because if I give this function a good name, which is readable and understandable, and I call it in my higher order function, I think the things will be more readable than doing the block lambda in line. Well, that was an obvious one, right? Let's go to the next one. Returning a stream. And this one is debatable, of course. Eh? Everything is debatable. I mean, let's get into streams. What is a stream? Well, I think we have to say, what is it not? A stream? not a data structure. And again, what is not a stream is not a data structure. So it's so important or so nice, I said it twice. No, not really, it's important. Keep that in mind. Because what is a stream? A stream is a flow of data, which particularly or most of the times is derived from a collection. And you can, re you can create pipelines with it uh, with different higher order functions. And for most, uh, foremost, it's an intermediate result. Do I have? Yeah. It's lazy evaluated, and an, it's, in, it, it's an intermediate result. So it's like your working copy. It's not you want to give to your end customers. OK. They say it can transform data, but cannot mutate data. Let's keep that one to another slide. But first. On streams, we have different kind of operations. You probably know that. We've got the intermediate operations, which give you back a stream. And we've got the terminal operations, which actually give purpose to that stream because it reduces or collects the stream into something that is necessary or that is actually worth working with, like a list, a set, or a single value. Well, there is one thing with streams. That's why a stream is not a data structure. You can only use a stream once. I mean, if I call the line, the for each line, line one over here, and I print it out, it's perfectly fine. It perfectly works. But if I call the second one, I will end up with an illegal state exception because the stream can only be consumed once. A stream is a single chain of operations, and it's never, ne never meant to be persistent. So what would you think if somebody returns you a stream? Do you know 100% sure that the stream is not already consumed? I don't. On the other hand, it's an intermediate result. So should you uh, pass it back? I think it's more appropriate and more safe to return something that is really worth uh, uh, returning, like a collection or something. You do not know if the stream is already consumed. So in my opinion, you should not return a stream if it's not necessary. Of course, there are some sidelines on that. If you have a potentially, um, if you have a, uh, uh, if you have a potential uh, stream of data that can be infinite, then you can return a stream. But how many times do you have that? So, as a rule of thumb, please do not return a stream unless you really, really, really thought about it. Consuming a stream or not consuming a stream. Well, I, thought, I told you about these functions that are working on streams. So if you see my, my really nice drawing over here, it's a stream. First, we have a collection. It's a bucket in this case. And we've got a pipeline. Say, for instance, the first one is a map function, and the second one's, one is a filter function. OK, people tend to write it and execute. And it doesn't do anything. Why not? It is lazy, like I am. You have to give it purpose, so you have to end it with a terminal function, like collect it into whatever, reduce it into something. And when you do it, then, then the stream will have purpose, will be kicked off, goes through your pipeline, and ends up in your 
reduce function. Well, let's look at the next example. Does anybody have any idea what work, what's, what's going to happen here? Great reaction, because nothing happens. I mean, limit, map, and peak are all three intermediate functions which, re which return you a stream. And I said a stream is lazy. It doesn't have The peak one is a nasty one within the stream API and handle. And I did it over here with a pretty ugly block lambda. But it doesn't do anything until I finally. Uh, so I tried this yesterday, and I'm still waiting for the result. Yeah, let's continue. But if I, for instance, call for each on it, then we will have uh, the behavior we expected. The peak one is a nasty one, I said, because now we give intermediate, or through your stream out, we give it a runtime exception. The peak is not meant to be used like this. Please use the peak only for things like debugging. A peak is something you only use uh, to, to print out what's uh, evaluated in your stream or not. But please don't use it like this and give logic to it. Next one. And this one is more, even more debatable. It's like. Mutable objects. Who likes immutable objects? Like mutable objects. Well, then we're quick. Thank you. This was it. No. OK, if we look at the definition of functional programming, that's a whole bunch of text, right? But there are a few things important in this piece of text. It is functions, avoiding change in state, and mutable data. It works well. It, it's, a, it's a declarative style of programming. And it works with expressions. So functions, avoid changing state, immutable data, declarative programming, and expressions. Well, if we work with mutable data, um, it's pretty hard to keep track of what this object is doing, right? I mean, it can be in one state, it can be in another state, and if I pass it to a, uh, to a function, you have not exactly a clue what will end up, how it will end up. I mean, you have a mutable, ob uh, immutable object, and you work it into a function, and it stays immutable, of course, then you're actually only asking something of that object. You're asking what its state is, or whatever it is. So you more or less have something like a pure function then. And the funny thing about a pure function is, if you have a pure function, then you have a finite amount of operations you can do. So you simply can replace it with a lookup table. But if we take my, one of my favorite scientists, Albert Einstein, and take one of his quotes over here, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, that's insanity. It's, expect, it's exactly like working with, uh, with mutable objects. If I have an object, I put it into a function or put it into a method. And if it's mutable, I have no clue how it will end up. Actually, if I do that twice, it, you can end up with completely different results. And that's why I should say that asking a question should not change the answer, nor should, nor should asking it twice. It makes your life so much more easy. I mean, immutable objects give you last moving parts. It's easier to because you do not have to keep a mental mind map of what state of that object is. So, they say in some way that you cannot mutate a stream, right? If I do this on a stream, I want to set the name of my beer. It is not allowed. Let me have a look at that. Just a sec. So if I want to map over here, is it visible for everybody? Normally, if I would say, if I would give it a function like, OK, I have my beer, perfect, and I said beer dot set name. OK, what's the error about this? No instance of type variable R exists. Well, I can change that. I mean, let's go to the beer. And by simply 
just setting it but returning itself, it will work perfectly fine, I guess. My compiler is not complaining. Let's run it. Awesome. I mean, in this line, I print my new beers, and in this line, I print my old beers. And you see, in both ways, I changed the name. So you can mutate the objects inside the stream. Hmm. But let's be honest, you shouldn't. It's a nasty trick. It's a nasty one, and I've seen people doing it like, well, I'm not allowed to, but I can. What you do? I would say, give, just give back a new object. If we go to the beer example again, and instead of having the setter like this, let's change it, just for, name, uh, just for namesakes, into with name. And I just not return the old one. I just return a new beer with the new name and the original alcohol percent. If I call it over here now, of course I have to change it over here. If I call it again now, see that the new list contains the new names and the old list contains the old names, which is pretty convenient because now I can compare them. Because if you do not use mutable objects, or if you use mutable objects and you change it, it's in no way that you can compare them anymore. You have to keep that track. And I think that's pretty easy in this example. But if you work with large enterprise programming uh, landscapes, it is quite hard to find the bugs over there. OK. Get back here. Mm -mm. So. You can mutate, but you shouldn't. Please record your copy. Makes your life far more easier. Next one, the for each. Well, the for each is a terminal function inside Stream API. And it can take a consumer. And the for each is most of the time used to do side, to side effects on a stream, which is kind of cool. I mean. It's simply a for loop without the external iterator. So it's a perfect example of declarative programming. But there's always a but. For instance, we can do this. Quite easy code. I can, on, on every in, in the stream, I can print it out. But what people tend to do, it works on a stream, it works on a collection. Doesn't matter. But what people tend to do is tend to do things like this. They say, well, streams are lazy. Awesome. And for each is like declarative programming. And declarative programming is the same as functional programming, right? No. If you see the first line, or the enrich with ratings line, we try to mutate our object and set the ratings from another data source into my beer. And then I try to enrich the same object again, using the for each, and try to set the review uh, comments on it. But what you actually do is simply syntactic sugar. You run to the same loop, or you want to run to the same collection twice, because for each is a terminal function. So by using the for each function, you evaluate your stream from top to bottom. And we did that twice. Can you imagine if you do this with 1 million or 1 billion records? It's a performance increase, not. So please make sure that you know what you're doing. Little side note, who of you ever used the flat map function in the Stream API? Who ever looked what the flat map implementation in Java 8 is? Inside it will use the for each function. So you tend to lose a little of the laziness of streams when using the flat map function. Be careful with that. 
So for each terminal function, make sure that you only use it at the end and not using it twice or three times or four times just to make sure that you want to set a side effect. Next one, order of operations. It's, it's again something laziness. People tend to think that I'm, streams are lazy, I can be lazy, so the order of, of my assignments is of non-importance. Well, let's look at the, fo uh, the following assignment. Say I have a couple of beers, and every beer has a brewer, and every brewer has a country. Now I want to have the first three unique brewer's countries from the beer library as a comma-separated string. Take a few seconds to look at the code and tell me if it's wrong or right. Who thinks that this one is right? Who thinks that this one is wrong? And the rest is still sleeping. Well, of course it's wrong. It's about these two lines. The distinct and the limit, I do it on the brewer, and I want to brew his countries, because, yeah, even in Holland, the small country I come from, there is more than one brewer. So by moving these down, this, down the line like this, we actually distinct on the brewer's countries. OK, but we are all good programmers. We all write unit tests, and we all test our programs until the end of the world, right? So we will find this out. Because good unit testing, yay. OK, well, this is just wrong data. And we can handle this by covering it with unit tests. But let me go to the next example. Please, yes, I want to have a mirror back. Say, for instance, I have the function over here. I have an iterator that actually has an infinite amount of iterations. I distinct it, I'll limit it to 10, and I print everything out. But look what happens. It gives me a 0, it gives me a 1, but the program doesn't terminate, as you can see. Let's turn over to my like Melano here, and you see probably that my CPU is still occupied for 100%. Okay. The problem over here is quite simple. My iteration over here, what does it give me? It gives me a 0 and a 1 and a 0 and a 1 and a 0 and a 1 forever. Then you have the distinct function. It says, okay, I have a 0. And the next one, the zero I already have, and the next one I already have. Then a limit function kicks in and says, OK, my first item is a zero. My second item is a one. My third item is, and it's waiting forever. So what does if I would simply limit this to two, by accident, it will terminate. Look. You see? But what we actually should have done is limit over here and remove this one. And if you run it now, you will end up with a terminal function. So the order of operations is quite important over here. Can you imagine what will happen if we say we have this magic wand called parallel? Who, who, who's, who's a bit chilly over here? Just wait. It's starting to heat up over here now. I, I hear the fans like zooming and zooming and zooming, and it's getting hot. So you see what the problem over here is, is that if you do not take care of the order of operations, and you say, well, let's do this in parallel, you end up with all your threads being consumed by this function doing absolutely nothing. Hmm. And then I didn't write any unit test, and this one I just pushed completely to production because my CI CD pipeline told me that I can. 
Hmm. It's not pretty high, right? So what should you do? First of all, make sure that the order of operations is correct. Second, why would you use an infinite stream? Take care of that. I mean, in nine out of 10 times, we do not have to use an infinite stream. Infinite streams can be cool, and even infinite streams have their, their ability to do things that you normally shouldn't do shouldn't, or, or couldn't do. But I think 99% of the times, we can end up with a finite stream. And if we have a finite stream, at least the thing terminates. That's the least of my concerns. Second, make sure that the order of operations is correct. So, yeah, I show you this, will run forever, awesome. So, first of all, look closely at the order of operations. The order of operations is just simply uh, from top to bottom. And that, only use the infinite streams when absolutely necessary. I mean, we have things like the range on the int stream, we've got the range closed on the int stream, and since Java 9, we have the iterate, which can hold a, um, how do you call it? How do you, uh, that, that holds a, can hold a predicate, so you are sure that your infinite stream will terminate, or your stream will terminate finally. And come after this in production is not a good way to work. Optionals, one of my favorite. I mean, the first line always scares people. It's kind of Java's implementation of the maybe monad. Well, don't be scary. It's not that hard. I mean, normally in, uh, in the, my, my Haskell books at the university, it would say a monad is a fuzzy thing that makes your life easier. It took me a few years to, to, to master that. But what it wants to do, it wants to encapsula encapsulate certain behavior. In this case, the possibility that you can end up with a null value. But we at Java developers can simply consider it as a wrapper, nothing more. And it focuses on unpacking the optional before using it. So what you simply do by giving an option from your function, you say to your user, hey, dude, this one, this function can have an empty. It can be empty. It can have an empty result. So please check it before you use it. which, in my opinion, is a good thing. But we can also do this. We live in an object-oriented world, and yeah, we think that optional will have empty and something. But because we live in an object-oriented world, we can set an optional to nil. And I saw this once or twice, and we actually have the old problem back again. So if we just... If we just agree over here that we will never set an optional to null, we're, we will probably be fine. OK, so I have my optional, and I need to unpack it, right? So we have this function get on it. But the problem with that is, if it's empty, it will give such element. Cool. So I have to give the optional filled with something, right? All right, let's do this. I have this optional. I will tell, I will ask it if if if, it's, if the value is present, and then I will use it. Can somebody please tell me how this it, this is anything better than doing a old school null check? It's not. We're doing the same thing, but now with a wrapper function. Cool. But this is not the way you 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 supposed to use use optionals. You can use it, yeah, like this, but it's not a good thing, because there are certain functions on optionals like the if present which will only evaluate the function it's given to when the optional has a actually has a value. The same holds for map. You can map a function over uh, on your optional, but it will only be executed when the optional is actually there. So the code will be more concise, we will be more read readable, and you do not have to do these ugly checks like we used to do before on nulls. OK, this is cool. but what if I want to do something else with that optional? Hmm. Let me get back to some code. So I have an optional over here. This optional is called optional foo, so it's filled. And I map my function run if exists on it, and oh, this one is not good. It has to be something else. It has to be like this. 
I already spoiled it now. So I run my map function it, and I run my if if it's not there, I run uh, I run something else, and I print the string that's finally there. I mean, my run if empty simply returns a string. If run if exists simply runs a string and gives me a side effect by printing something, and the run if empty gives me a default value which is empty. Okay, so if I look at this code, I would say that my hypothesis is that the value of foo will be foo, right? Who disagrees on that? Thank you. So let's run this one. And what do you see that finally foo is there? But what we see as well is that both my functions run if exists and the function run is empty are both evaluated. What does that mean? That means that we have to be careful with this one. Um, if you do this and say, for instance, people tend to go into a database, look if the user already exists, it gives me back an optional. And if I have that optional, if it's there, I want to use it in, with a certain function. If it's not there, I want to insert that one. If I do it like this and I use the or else function on it, and you see that the or else the part, the part inside the URL is, also, uh, is always evaluated, then you end up with duplicate, with duplicate values in your database or a collision. So what should you do? There is a simple other function called or else get. And with or else get, you can give it a supplier. By doing it like this, And running it, you will see that the only thing that is actually evaluated is the run if exists, and not the run if empty. And the problem is, in this case, is that uh, I think it's counterintuitive. In my opinion, if you have the or else, you would probably think, if you didn't go into the implementation of it, that it will have some kind of short circuiting, like we normally do with if else statements or with uh, operators but it doesn't. Or else it's actually only meant to give you a default value um, if the value is not present, not to execute any logic. If you want to execute any logic, please use the or else get. I made this mistake once, and it was like, huh? But I tend to see it um, in many places where people do not actually know what the difference between or else and or else get is. But as you just promised me, you all write perfectly working unit tests, you will end up with without any problem, right? So what does that mean? Yeah, we have two functions, or else, or else get, and or else throw. The or else throw is pretty obvious. It can throw an exception if it's not there. I showed you this one. I showed you this one. So when using the or else function, make sure that what's in the or else function doesn't contain any side effects because you saw that it will, it will be evaluated anyway. Only use your else function to assign value to that string in this case. If you want to work with alternative flows and you want to execute some code because the optional is empty, please make the distinction between or else and or else get and use your else get in this case. Question, who of you knows what this is? And don't say a rocket, because that's quite obvious. No, almost, almost. It's the Ariane 5. The Ariane 5 is a, yes, in Europe we have something with rockets as well. We're tiny, we're not as powerful as the US, I know, but we had, this was in, I think it was 95, 96, something. Let me take a look, got it here somewhere. It doesn't work. Yes, it was a 96. And the problem with the Ariane 5 was that it tries to co try to convert a um, uh, it tries to convert a integer into a long value, and you or uh, the other way around, sorry, a long value into an integer value. It was about the velocity. 
So in the first place, when the rocket was actually going up, the velocity wasn't that high. So the conversion from, 32 to, uh, from 64 to 32 bytes wasn't a problem. But after the uh, speed went up and it goes further and further and further, an exception was thrown. And it wasn't caught properly, or it wasn't the, 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 the software did, didn't work properly. And it finally ended up with exploding midair. Moral of the story, exceptions are important. So checked exceptions and lambdas. Say, for instance, I have this function. It's, it's called is empty exception. I mean, I'm a, not an alcoholic. I'm a drinker. And I think you have to check that your glass is not empty before you drink, right? It would be pretty silly. So if this is a checked exception, is this possible? No, it's not. You cannot use a checked exception inside a lambda. Right? So what can you do? Let me give you a code example. So let's get into exceptions. Let's get this one back. So for instance, I have a function over here on top which throws an exception. I have an initial list of beers, and I have a function over here. I want to map this function over it. The compiler doesn't agree with me. So what can I do? People like, OK, hey, we have IntelliJ. So we can say, hey, surround it with a try catch. Awesome. What shall I do? Weekend. Yes, you can do this. Of course you can do this. But we agreed in the first place that block lambdas are ugly, right? And I've been paying attention. So I can do th things like this. <laughs> Where is it? Extract. And I make a method out of, it, out of it, and I get dry beer, or try something. Try something. It's a good name. OK, perfect. I can remove this. I can remove this. Hey, and now it works. I have it in a separate function. My lambda is, again, clean. You could probably argue if you should use a method reference over here, but that's not the, 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 the debate is going, that's going on now. Um, well, it looks like a good, a good thing, right? You can. If you need to catch that exception and do something particularly for that case, you can do this and, of course, not throw a runtime here, but do your actual thing you want to do. It's perfectly fine. But come on, please be, be honest to me. Who does this thing like, hey, I have an exception. Let's cover a runtime exception and throw it up again, and let's continue. Who, whoever did that, I did, multiple times. In many, time, in, many, in many ways, by doing this, I'm like, OK, I checked everything on forehand, if it's there or not, if, if I can have IO exception. So well, if there is an exception, it is the end of the world. So I want, don't want to do this every single time I'm here. So, Let's revert this code. And I'm back to the original one. So what we can do is write our own utility. And I write it in this case in it to make it just a little visible. First of all, I make a functional interface. Yes? And make a. Cool. All right. And not just applying it, but I say it can, it throws an exception. By making this functional interface, I can then make myself a function, which me 
safe. And let's call it wrap. All right. And yes, I will do this in an ugly block lambda. I'm sorry, but just to make it visible for you. Returning a new function, hmm. I'm going to try over here. I simply apply the function over here. And of course, return it because it's a function. And I do the catch. exception over here and wrap it back into a runtime exception. Okay, what did I do wrong? And I'd still complain this one is dir. Ah, imports. Course imports. So by doing this, I and I put it back into a utility, put it far, far away inside my code base, never look at it again because it's an ugly block lambda. But I can use it now to simply wrap my function over here, my lambdas, or keep my stream kind of clean, and it runs. Done, right? Again, oh, this one it goes well because the exception is thrown five minutes. It's thrown um, randomly. Can anybody tell me what the problem over here is? I wrapped it, yes. And the, the thing is, if I wrap it and throw a runtime exception, Every time the runtime exception kicks in, it will end my stream at that point. It will not evaluate my, the rest of my stream. It's pretty weird, right? We're working with streams which can be um, infinite, and we want to evaluate whatever we want. It's pretty silly to cut off this evaluation at the point of a runtime exception. Personally, I would say make an exceptional situation or make a failure is also data. So I want to evaluate my whole line uh, in my, in my, inside my stream, and finally end up with a collection of, say, goods and bads. How do we do that? Well, for instance, we can introduce something new. It's an eater function, or an eater type. And the eater type is something that borrowed from functional languages, but it's not particularly functional. It's just a wrapper type like can have a left or a right. It can be both. So it can handle type A, or in our case, an exception and a success. Hmm. Great. By doing this and wrapping your function into an either, you end up not with a list of values, but with a list of eaters. And just like the optional, you can choose if you the left or the right part. We agree with each other that normally the right is the wrong part because the right part is right. And how do we use it? I mean, it simply is either a left or a right. Now, you can do all sorts of things on it. This is a pretty naive implementation. But I wrote a lift function over here which simply has that checked function I had and turns it to a right if, the, if it works and turns it to a left if the exception is there. By using this function instead of my own wrapper function I just wrote a couple of minutes ago, like this, we will end up with three values, either values. And we see that the first and the second, 
did OK. And the last one, the left one, has an exception. OK, that's fine. But now, well, we can uncover it again, and we can do whatever we want. Or we can filter the exceptional situations out and only keep the good ones, just as you want. I mean, I don't want my code to lead me. I want to lead my code. I want to do what I want. So in this case, I have the power back to evaluate my complete stream and make the result of the eater. Uh, I can, with the result of the eater, I can decide what I want to do with it. The problem here is I now have only an exception. And people who are familiar with things like Scala or, or uh, other uh, functional languages, you say, yeah, you can try, right? And a try is a simplification of that either type, which can, ha which can hold a failure or a success, which the failure is an exception, and the success is the value you actually wanted. The only problem with that is, and it's the same with this function, I only have the exception uh, covered into the left. Normally, if I want to retry it, you probably want the original value as well. And with the either type, you have the power that you can stuff in anything you want. So you can also stuff in the original value. So you can probably rerun the mistakes uh, that, that, that were there. Because in some cases, these mistakes are just temporary. By using this other function over here, I write, I simply pair the exception up with the original value. So you finally end up with the exception, what, what, what happened, and the original value. I, wrote, I, I used a pair for it. By doing this like this, you see, this, you see that the first one get, uh, got me back a beer. The second one was a failure, and it gives me back the exception plus the original value. So I know what went wrong. And finally, the last one gives me a good value. Well, I also called the tryout. The try, what I said, was a simplification of that uh, either type with either a failure or a success. And take a look if you want to, lo uh, want to use this. Of course, you can use this code, but it was a pretty naive implementation. You can. Uh, at a library called Faber. They have all sorts of nifty functions that can help you with functional programming style of programming. And they have implementations for try and either. And these things like these lift functions over here, they have them baked in for you. It's a pretty large library. So if you only want to use it for exception, uh, exceptional situations or for exception handling, it's perhaps a bit big. But I would urge you to take a look at that library and make sure that uh, you use this to your advantage. All right, I'm uh, out of time, so I has, have one uh, topic to go, and I will skip through it because time is running out. My name is Brian. Um, this is my Twitter handle. This is my email address. If you want to have, uh, if you want to ask questions, please come up. Or please ask questions. I will be walking around this area the whole week. I do have stickers. People love stickers, so you can get them over. And um, I want to thank you too for uh, choosing my talk as the first talk of your conference. Have a great code one, and thank you so much. <laughs>